Okay, hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture three. As I see from the title on the today's slide, we're talking about combinational logic. And so, as promised, we're going to rapidly cover some of the basics of Chisel. Uh, as a result, we said after today's lecture, especially after uh, Wednesday's lecture, because Monday's a holiday, you should basically be able to do anything in Chisel you can do in structural Verilog. And basically, from there on, we're going to be doing more and more sophisticated and flexible things to keep building up. So basically, within you know, the first four lectures, we're going to get back to wherever you are coming in from another language, and then we're going to build past that. Um, so uh, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do a few things. Uh, yes, we're going to talk combinational logic, but we're also going to talk a little bit about parameterization, right? We said one of the nice features about building generators is having parameters to kind of adapt to what we need to do. And we'll show a really simple example of that. Um, to set things up, we'll talk a little bit more about Scala. It's kind of the style we're going to have in this course, talk a little about Scala, and then show you using Chisel and back and forth. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time today really trying to emphasize the interaction between Chisel and Scala, and I think that's the, honestly, conceptually the hardest part of the entire course. Um, but I think we can do it. And if you all get it, great. All done from there, trust me. It's like the hardest part. Um, and then uh, as a result today, you know, you should be able to say, hey, I can go create uh, a Chisel component that's, you know, a combinational circuit. Yeah, no problem. I can even do a parameterized. And so that'll be the goal from today. Okay, so we can go ahead and load up our notebook. Um, so uh, what's one combinational component we might want? Perhaps a MUX, right? So remember a MUX, you know, a multiplexer, uh, takes in two inputs and given a select signal, chooses which one to take, right? Um, so there's a few different ways to write these in Chisel. For today, right now, when you use just the direct syntax, you say MUX, whatever the select signal is, this may be a condition directly, maybe, you know, A equals 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 B or something, or it could be, you know, like some actual Boolean signal or something. Uh, and then the two inputs. Now, one thing I want to point out, uh, one is before zero, right? <laughs> so if this condition is true, it's this one, right? I think most people, if they write this contract themselves from scratch, they would think, oh, I would put, you know, zero, one, or you count a sentence, it's very natural. Uh, the reason why they did the reverse direction like this, this is kind of like a, a ternary, a question mark, like in C, right? Where you can like, it's, you know, if condition, true case, false case, is kind of way you think of it, right? Um, it's a small detail, but I want to highlight it now, and maybe at some point you'll forget and you'll run into this issue and you'll remember this, but hopefully we won't uh, have this issue. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of thing. So the true case, false case. Uh, so this is just, you know, a simple two input MUX. Uh, there's a lot more types of MUXs, right? They're in the library for the language. Uh, you can do things like arbitrary cases. You can do a one hot encoded MUX, et cetera. Those are all available. Um, so let's go ahead and try and play it in some code, right? So here we have that MUX. Pretty simple, right? We have our select, Input one, way one, you know, input zero, way zero. Uh, I wrapped it inside of a module so we have a chance to actually instantiate it. And of course, our module, we need to actually have, you know, wires for all of these things, right? So the select signal, the inputs, the outputs, you see they're all one bit signals. So if we just, you know, of course, uh, have this, well, we've defined the, you know, a class, which is a module, right? You know, a chisel component. It's a mux, but you know, what do we do to hardware? Well, one thing you do to hardware is you can said you can look at the Verilog and see how does this actually turn out. And yeah, well, Verilog is actually gonna use <laughs> the, the ternary statement, right? So Verilog has no problem if you're putting the one first, because it's like the ternary with the question mark, right? So if you've ever done like a ternary in, or in, in Verilog, uh, that matches up just fine with that, right? Um, cool, question, yes. Oh yeah, so what happens if you accidentally get in one and zero backwards? Uh, your code's gonna have the inverse logic, right? So it's not gonna have the compile time issue because any signal's valid to go here, any signal's valid to go here, right? It's just that you're, you're you know, and you're just gonna be backwards. So, you know, you, and maybe later on you go and find, oh, I'm gonna negate this control signal. Wait, instead of negating this control signal, I should swap these maybe, right? You know, There's other ways to do muxes, um, but this is the kind of way to kind of get it going. And so part of why I showed this mux first is kind of an example of, yeah, here's a, Combinational component, usually your chisel components will, you know, chisel modules will be much larger in a single mux. You'll have, you know, quite a few lines just by building a module, but we're starting somewhere, right? We're getting going. Cool. Other questions? Okay. So, um, you may notice that if you go back a slide, actually, that the module, right, uh, that's kind of like, you know, at the end of this, right? So what's going on? Well, actually, 
technically, when we have these components in Chisel, they are officially a, a class in Scala, right? Uh, so you build objects in Scala, right? And it's extending here. Uh, that's actually using some object-oriented inheritance in order to bring in the Chisel module goodness. So class comes from Scala, module comes from Chisel. But so yeah, so we're, we're going to talk for a minute about this class. That's kind of you know this fundamental Scala thing we're building off of, right? So going into Scala's class, uh, it's an interesting syntax they chose for their classes, right? Um, for example, the class itself takes arguments, right? These are the arguments for the constructor. So, um, you know, maybe a lot of languages you've seen, you can have like overloaded constructors. You can have multiple constructors for a given object. Uh, you can do that in Scala, but it's gonna be different than this. But for the most part, um, classes have one constructor and the constructor arguments are right here. And so basically, you almost think of like a function call in a way, right? Where it's like, you call, you know, new my class instantiate it. You give it these arguments. These arguments, you know, go into sides of the class and an entire body is evaluated. So it doesn't just need to be either fields or methods. They can actually be arbitrary code, right? So usually in most object-oriented languages inside of a class, you have, you know, fields, you know, certain attributes, and maybe you have like methods or functions. You can have those. You can also just have arbitrary code. So in this case, you know, it has a field, uh, like a, a line of code here, name, a print statement. So you can see, of course, when you run this, well, uh, what happens? Uh, okay, sure. So we define the class and then, you know, to actually sanction it, you use a new keyword, uh, you know, class name and then the arguments. You know, if I forgot one of these arguments, it's gonna yell at me, right? Um, okay, uh, let's kind of pre-show what we're doing for a second. Now, tie in the last time, right? We have this field name, which is basically just saving this args. So for example, if I tried to reassign that name, no, 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 can't do that because, hey, it's a val. I remember vals only get it right once. So it's that one value. Now, of course, made it a var. Sure. No problem, right? You can, you can change that. Um, and what else can we do? Well, we can kind of go digging around. Now, one interesting thing is let's say, for example, I wanted to, um, uh, you know, grab this attribute of the class. Well, if I tried this, it's going to say it's not a member, which... To be honest, not the most helpful message in my opinion. The issue is not that it's not a member. The issue is you don't permission to read it. So uh, these are all public by default. These are all uh, protected by default. And so basically you need to, if you do that, then it's fine. And so occasionally, uh, you know, there's an argument that, you know, you know you're not going to bother changing inside the body of the class. And so the format comes into the class inside the, um, the argument list is perfect. Make that a val so that way you can actually access it. And because it's a val, part of why it's helpful is that you know there's no chance of you mutating it, right? So in general, arguments when they come in, they are vals, right? I can't, even if I didn't have this case, right? I can't reassign our guess, right? I don't think I should. <laughs> nope. Oops, I commented out the wrong thing. That's a whole other issue. But independent of that issue, yeah, reassign with the val. So they, even though the val keyword's not there, it is a val. It's just by putting the val keyword there, you're conveying it's public. These are a little esoteric details, but pragmatically, day to day, what does this mean when you're writing your Scala code? Well, when you write things like modules, they usually are Scala objects. The arguments come in as arguments to the class. And yeah, they're, they're vals, right? So basically, you only can, they're, they're, the time the call function is called, they're locked in stone. If you want to change them, you can drive something else from them. Cool. Questions? Okay. Um, oops. Let's go here to go advance things. Great. So uh, let's take it one step further. Okay, so we had a mux before. Let's make it a little spiffier, right? So what if we add a, a parameter? Let's just set the width of the inputs or outputs, right? So in this case, we'll take a single parameter, which is going to be an integer, a number. And it's going to um, set the width, right? So, uh, you know, we can have a W bit inputs, a W bit output. You know, here's shown pictorially, we can have these all be W bits, no problem. Um, and cool. And then, as you can see, for the most part, this is a pretty light tweak to our code, right? We had to add this parameter here. We had to, you know, these used to be bools, now they're uints with a certain width. 
Uh, if we go ahead and look at the barrel log for this, yeah, we can see, oh yeah, made 8-bit signals, no problem. I can even make this a 1-bit signal, and basically it's the exact same output as we had two slides ago. Um, I can make this negative, it's going to yell at me, so I probably should have had an assertion. Oh, even worse, it hangs. Great. Um, it's fine. So let's make it back to 8. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so... As you can see, once you have parameters and users using parameters, of course, you may have to start thinking about things like assertions and checking in parameters. But that's, that's, that's a future lecture. Yes. Uh, I mean, you, you can do something as simple as, you know, uh, require uh, w greater than or equal to zero, right? So then. It knows it shouldn't do that, but uh, maybe maybe it still gives an error message. So part of the issue is that when we're using um, uh, the environment inside Jupiter, it's not quite the same as the environment inside of like SPT running normally. And so some of the error messages and some of the assertions and some of the exceptions don't quite behave the way they should. Um, so yeah, you would use a require and assert, but yes, it's breaking it. Now, if we get it back for a second, uh, what's this going to do? Should hopefully work. Um, so a lot of things in Chisel actually are designed to support zero-bit things and automatically prune things away, but also to handle it gracefully. Um, so there are situations where you can imagine, let's see, you have a generator, and your generator is using a mux to pick between things, right? And if you have n things, and you're doing, you know, a direct encoding, not a one-hot encoding, you need, you know, log base two of n bits in your select signal, right? Here we have two things, log base two of two is one, so we need one bit to select. What happens if you know you have a generator that's very flexible and you have this, you know, mux, which is, you know, arbitrary size to match the thing? What was only one thing to select from, right? Well then, log base two of one is zero, so you actually need a zero bit select signal. If you set your generator up correctly, it's gonna handle that without special case. It's just gonna do the right thing. It's gonna realize that's zero, the wire's gonna be zero width, the tool flow can handle it, so surprisingly, yeah, the chisel and fertile tool flows can handle zero-bit wires in a lot of places. Cool. Other questions? Okay. So then, uh, let's talk about making things conditional, right? Because so far we've had kind of, you know, straight shot logic, right? You know, what about making a little bit more choices, right? So, well, first let's do it in Scala, right? So, um, Scala has an if and else, so I mean, if and else statement, right? That's nothing too crazy. You've seen that in your first programming course, you know, if condition else. Now, there are some small, interesting wrinkles to it, right? I think the one that's underappreciated is that it returns something, right? So it's not just a control flow thing. Whatever is the last line of the direction it goes is return value. So here, that return value is being returned back to the interpreted context, but no one's doing anything with it. But like here, for example, we are taking it, right? We're saying, hey, x is equal to, it's either, after this line, either x is going to be either 3 or 4, depending on the value condition. Um, and so, yeah, you can have this very nice compact syntax like this in this case, right? You know, based on, you know, conditions true. Oh, yeah, so if, of course, you go to the true case. But like I said, here we're taking advantage of the fact that, yeah, these if statements return things. Uh, and so, yeah, so it's true. So we're going to get 3 in x, right? Uh, of course, if we, you know, made this false, right, it's going to, you know, go to the false case and get four down here, right? And so actually, it's encouraged in Scala to, you know, especially when you're doing these cases where you have if statements and you're returning the thing from the if statement rather than just calling it for control flow side effects. Um, if you can fit it in one line nicely, you should. It's actually considered more readable that way. It's kind of like clear what's going on. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting little thing. So. This is nothing super unique. This may seem unusual in comparison to like C, but uh, in Python, you can do this if trick. Uh, and a lot of functional languages let you do something similar. But I still want to highlight this is not, you know, every language has this feature. Cool. Uh, as you also can see, the braces, for example, uh, if you have a single statement, you don't need braces, but, you know, multiple lines, yeah, you should do, you have braces like other languages. Um, cool. Okay. So. We just saw how to do if statements in Scala. We started this lecture with doing muxes and chisel, which is kind of a harder equivalent of an if statement in a way. You're choosing between two things. So that's the thing. So in, in software, when you do an if statement, you're kind of like, you're either going to do the, you know, the true clause or the false clause. 
In hardware, you kind of do both things always, and you kind of just choose the answer you want based on a mux. So we can kind of see that, right? So with a mux, um, we're going to have circuitry for both possible things. So this circuit diagram is a little complicated. We can kind of parse our way through it. Uh, so I, here I've you know, shown how to write uh, an absolute value circuit in hardware, right? So how did I do that? Well, uh, of course, for absolute value, if the signal is greater than zero, you don't need to do anything to it. But if it's less than zero, then you need to invert it, right, to make it, to make it positive, right? So that's what we did, right? Hey, if this is less than zero, the true case is first. Remember, mux is the true case is first. Invert it. If this case condition is false, then do this, right? So in terms of the hardware, you're going to get both paths, right? You, when you're building hardware, you know, it's not like it magically appears, magically disappears, right? You get both paths, right? So we have the don't modify at all path, and we have the inverted path, right? And we see that's controlled by this comparator, which is looking at the value we're considering, as well as you know comparing it to zero. Um, so yeah, so the hardware really does have both paths. It's just a matter of picking which hands to compute both compute both results. So hardware computes both minus x and x, right? X coming straight through minus x through this path. It doesn't matter which one we're choosing based on this mux. There's one additional wrinkle to this because we're doing uh, a comparison where we care about where something is positive or negative, we need to use the essence, right? That's why it's dot s rather than dot u. But like for 98% of this course, it'll be dot u because uh, you know regular un unsigned number. Uh, you'd be surprised how in real hardware circuits, the signed class is really pretty rare. Um, if someone that makes a simulator, so I look at the, you know, what, what, what the signs go through it. Uh, you know, it's, it's a few percent. Most things are uns. Um, cool, questions on the chisel one first, yes. So I'm just taking the absolute value. I'm not trying to do like a two's complement trick or anything. So the, the plus one is the two's complement recoding. Um, here I'm just trying to take the, like figure this like the raw, like, you know, algebra absolute value rather than like a two's complement conversion. So yeah, so the, uh, part of which, maybe, maybe to answer your question better, I should actually say, uh, at this level, we have not, you know, discerned the encoding of numbers, right? We just know we're treating this as a signed number. And hey, we're saying, hey, give me, assign comparison and give me a you know algebraic inversion you're right in the actual hardware the catalyst and realize oh wait you have a number and you want to invert it that's going to do you know the bitwise complement and the plus one like for two's complement conversion right but uh at this level here we are in nice you know high level operator land we can just say the minus sign right and, and let it figure it out those details um good point cool Okay, so then, um, so remember when we're building hardware, right? We are uh, describing hardware, but of course the hardware only exists once, right? It's not like we're gonna have hardware like changing the structure as it runs, right? Um, so the question is, well, how do we use a Scala FL? So what's that for? Uh, that's for us to make choices in the nature of hardware we're describing, right? So for example, um, if in, side of my code somewhere, I want this one line here where I say, hey, um, based on this invert parameter, invert condition, uh, I want to get either minus x or x. So basically what that means is in the generated hardware, you get one of these two things, right? You don't get both, you get one of these two. And the answer is you, whichever one you get is the one that was the value, you know, true or false case based on invert at the time you elaborate, at the time you actually ran your chisel generator program, right? And so this is interesting. So basically you can have Parameters you use at the time your you know designs elaborated to choose you know large things. Do I want you know this thing or not this thing? Do I want to support this feature, right? Do I want to support you know? Do I want to invert my inputs? If inverts true, then I'll invert it, right? Um, if not, I get the wire. And so you can kind of already see that this is giving us a little bit of that power to have uh, a program kind of choosing what hardware we're getting, right? Where the hardware we're getting is either minus x or x, but the program is this if else, right? And actually kind of choosing which of those two we're going to get. Pause here for any more questions. Yes. Oh, good question. So uh, I'm gonna repeat this for recording. The portion on the right is straight scholar, right? That's not chisel. Uh, yes, question mark. And the reason I say question mark is that uh, chisel is scholar, right? <laughs> it, 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 it's an embedded language. And so, yes, the if and else constructs are definitely from scholar. However, the things you are uh, the inversion condition, that better be a Scala variable or a Scala type. My, the things here, 
These could be chisel objects. Yeah. Cool. Good question. Um, great. So that was a wonderful segue question. I'm going to spend a minute talking about how these like things all mash together. So remember, when you write a design in Chisel, you're writing a Scala program, right? So it's a dot .scala file. Uh, you, we're going to pass that to the Scala compiler. Usually you don't even see that because I know you're done by SPT for the homeworks or it's done uh, under the hood by a Jupyter kernel for the, lab, for, the, for the labs and stuff. But yeah, it's actually being compiled to you know Java bytecode that's running on JVM. And, but the result is, yeah, there's a program. That program makes use of the Chisel library. When that program runs, as a result of its execution, it's going to create this, you know, fertile file, the circuit, the dot fur. Um, like I said, at this point, this is a program or a, a, a source code. At this point, it's a program, but until the program runs, it's not actually hardware. At this point, you know, you have a concrete instance, right? There's no more parameters, no more ambiguity, no more execution. Every line of that file is describing an exact piece of hardware. Um, and then you can pass this off. So it's interesting, for example, Sci-Fi, one of the largest users of uh, Chisel, uh, even though they're changing a lot of stuff internally in their tools, that's why I was saying how, you know, Chisel 5, Chisel 6, et cetera, are changing a lot of the internals. Interestingly, they're keeping circuit uh, fertile around, right? And the reason why is they like that as a way to serialize hardware designs. They know that different languages of Scala come and go, different languages of Chisel come and go. But for archiving the hardware designs, when they want to keep their IP around for five plus years to support a customer or something, uh, Fertile is a pretty concrete low level description of the hardware that's, you know, pretty robust. And so they're keeping that around. Um, that's kind of fun. Okay, so like I said, you're writing a Scala program. It happens to use the Chisel library. And as a result of your program running, you get the circuit file out. So what does it actually look like? Well, like I said, the elaborated hardware, the actual design, just came out of your program. So you, you write a Scala program. And what's interesting is, you know, as your program runs, under the hood is, you know, building up, you know, a design using the library. And then when the program ends, usually there's a like line of code. For this course, you're not gonna call it yourself. It's already in the provided code, but that line of code says, hey, take that design, which is in memory right now, and spit it out as fertile. There's a line that does that. Uh, and guess what? Then you have that concrete instance, right? And so kind of the way to think about this is um, the core operations we're using to build hardware are simple, right? We're not doing any kind of, you know, radical high-level synthesis or totally new concepts, right? We're using simple components, things like logic gates, adders, wires, registers. Put all these things together into a module, and you can change modules too, right? These are all simple constructs. These are not crazy things. Um, and guess what? When you're building a hardware design, all you're doing is instantiating those components, connecting them together, right? A hardware design is simply a collection of, you know, logic gates, wires, registers, and modules connected together, right? And so that's what we're doing, right? That we're using uh, Scala as a programmer to like, very productively connect these things together, right? So we're using a Scala program that chooses what to instantiate and connects them all together. That's what your programs are doing. So. In the beginning, your program is going to be simple, right? They're going to have not as much flexibility, not as much parameterizability, not as much generation capability. It's going to be a pretty straight line kind of code, just describe the components you want in your design and connect them all together. As we go through this course, we'll learn more sophisticated techniques and we'll build generators. So that way you're actually composing these components in ways that are interesting and surprising. And that's where you get the real power of productivity, right? Let's, you know, I opened today's lecture saying, oh yeah, a parameter, and I showed you have a parameterized bit width for a mux, right? Those of you who are Verilog experts can do that in Verilog, so you're probably pretty unimpressed by that, right? Um, guess what? We can do much more sophisticated things. You can build much more uh, interesting um, topologies and such, but that's kind of the key point, right? At the end of the day, you're just instantiating small, harder components, choosing what you're instantiating, and connecting them together. That's what you need to describe in your code. Now, you're going to write Scala code around all this stuff to kind of, you know, figure out what to instantiate, keep track of what you're instantiating, connect it all together, but at the end of the day, that's what you're doing. So you should be able to, uh, you know, if, if asked, draw out on paper or a whiteboard, an iPad, or whatever, the schematic what you're trying to build, right? So I keep showing some throughout these slides in this course, you know, trying to remind you of what you're building. If you find yourself trying to write a chisel component, and let's say you couldn't draw a schematic, it's not one thing to be like, yo, it's been complicated, I don't want to spend the effort, I'm too lazy. Another thing to say, like, actually, I couldn't. If you can't draw a schematic, it's going to be really hard to write the code, right? <laughs> like, you need to know what you're trying to build. If you know what you're trying to build, then you can go ahead and express it. Um, and of course, we're going to recommend the Agile approach of, you know, get something working. So, for example, your very first design for a certain component will probably be not very parameterized. It'll be very static and kind of, you know, 
constructed and perhaps to get more familiar for you to make things more flexible, more parameterized, et cetera. Um, preparing for this course, I reread some of the student comments and sets and stuff. And one of the things that stuck with me was one student said, for them, things really clicked when they thought of programming or designing with chisel as programming spatially instead of temporally. And I've added some words to their quote to um, kind of flesh out what they're saying. And I think it's a really good insight, basically. When you're writing normal programs, right, you are basically picking an order of operations, right? When you do operation X, do operation B, do the, et cetera, step by step. And this we learn to do in programming in like a language like C, how to take our problem, how to turn it into a sequence of steps that need to be done in order to get the right answer. That's what we've all learned how to do in the program. When we're programming hardware, in this case, we're, we're programming spatially, right? We're designing, and so we're saying, you know what? What are the components I want? Who's connected to who? And that's the kind of way to think of it. Rather than thinking of it as, you know, lines of code going in order, think of it more as, what is the hardware I want? Now, technically, you're writing Chisel, these two worlds are colliding, right? Where you are writing a program that's evaluated line by line in order, because it's a regular programming language. It just so happens that what your, your purpose for your program is to describe these components and connect them all together. That's kind of the key point. Oof, this is a conceptual leap, but if you get this, you're good for the entire quarter. And if not, let's talk about more questions. I have an example coming up in the next slide, but maybe I'll stop for questions so far. So maybe we can go back to our first lecture, or second lecture, I should say, where we had that XOR gate as a module, right? So that was our very first module in the Hello Chisel was, let's do an XOR gate. Uh, so why don't we analyze that for a second with this perspective, right? So if you think about it, okay, first look at, this, look at Scott, the, the code, right? Okay, here's our module. We have our XOR gate. Um, and I did a touch different than I did in the last lecture, where in the last lecture, um, I had this uh, right here. I can do that again. So it's exactly the same as original. Um, but the reason why I did it this way is it lets me kind of show things a little bit differently for the uh, schematic, right? So, um, and let's, let's go back to doing it the way we had it for today. I'm gonna add another line inside there. Actually it's not, it's gonna filter it out because it's smart to do that. Um, so wait, what happens? Well. Let's go through it, right? So first off, you know, okay, Scala object, sure. Go through line by line. Declare is an IO object, okay. The IO object inside of it has some more Scala references, A, B, and C. But let's say like, let's say like val A, right, inside of here. Input is a chisel construct. This is a port to a module. So guess what? That's gonna be a chisel object. And the way we can get back to the object, we have a reference to it, you know, like a language, you have like pointers and references, is with this reference A, right? Likewise with B, reference to the input. C is reference to the output. So we have all these things here. And then, oh yeah, we instantiate the XOR gate. So actually just this line by itself is this component, right? It says, hey, I want an XOR operation. And then we're gonna take IOA and IOB as, um, uh, the inputs, right? And so it's able to, you know, go through io.a, find a reference and follow it and connect it. And so you realize, oh wait, this line right here instantiates, you know, this XOR gate and connects these inputs to it all in one line. Then the following line connects the output io.c to whatever my gate was pointing to, right? Which happens to be its XOR gate. So here is kind of a more roundabout way of doing it. Like as I just showed you a minute ago, you can do this all in one line rather than two lines, but I think it's the point across, right? What are the fundamental hardware points we have in this particular uh, design? We have some ports and an XOR gate and the connections between them. And this Scala code over here does all that, right? It instantiates all the objects and connects them together. So here, it was kind of very seamless. We didn't really notice it, but yeah, when we described this XOR gate, we also were saying, oh yeah, I want these inputs. And guess what? It connected them there for us. Additionally, for example, on the output, uh, yeah. Um, in this case, we did it in two lines. I showed you earlier we could do it in one line. Notice how here we use an equal sign versus here we use the colon equals, right? So here is an equal sign. This is the Scala equals. This is how we, you know, assign something, right? So yeah, I want to, you know, make this val my gate. So I can't change my gate. It's going to point to this XOR gate. Here, I'm not creating anything. I'm just doing connections. So this colon equals, that's the connect operator. I want you to connect this. In particular, you know, you see up here in the slides, it reminds you, right? It takes the output of the thing on the right hand and assigns it to the input of the thing on the left hand. That's what it does. A lot of times in your designs, you will have you know, these Scala references or vowels to kind of keep track of things along the way. 
Sometimes you won't. Sometimes you can just kind of write these complicated chisel expressions and get all done in one line and not even bother naming things. And we'll parse through it, right? If I, you know, for example, uh, you know, had some, you know, other stuff here, that would make more chisel components. And they wouldn't necessarily have corresponding scale references because if you don't have a reference to them, you wouldn't be able to get to them. Cool. Questions? Okay. So um, in this prior slide, you know, we showed, uh, you know, example of this. And um, there are some situations where we want a wire, right? So so far we've shown like a logic gate, we've shown inputs and outputs. There's no cases where you, where you want a wire and chisel, right? So what do we mean by a wire? Well, it's kind of like the leg of wire in Verilog. Kind of the key thing is they're useful whenever you want to declare something where you don't know both endpoints at the time you use it, right? If you know the output of one thing is going to connect to the input of another thing and you have both of those handy to you, no reason to borrow for wire, right? Just connect it directly, right? Connect the output directly to the input and you're done. But there's some times in your code where you're going to produce the output one way and the input another way and you might not know both at the same time. It's handy to have a wire to kind of say, well, I'm connecting one thing to the wire, connect the other thing to the wire, and then I'll have both sides connected. So this is the exact same effective functionality, but it's done a little differently, right? We actually declare a wire. In this case, we know say, hey, wire, and we give it the type. The type is bool. That's the chisel one bit wire, right? Uh, you know, we connect the wire to the XOR gate, so it gets that result. And then we connect the output to the wire. So like I said, in this case, uh, it's going to cleverly uh, squish the wire out and understand it's, you know, constant propagation, right? But sorry, I'm not constant propagation. Uh, this is value propagation. But um, you can see it kind of came through right there, right? And once again, they kind of be very robust. You know, showing here, I'm showing all the, you know, environment diagrams to the right. Um, yeah, you see, for example, when I had this line here that says, uh, so at, at this point, you know, my wire is pointing to this. This line's interesting, right? This line goes out, creates an XOR gate, connects the inputs to the inputs specified. Now the result of this is the output of the XOR, which it then connects to the input of my wire, right? Right here. Like I said, it's one of these things where perhaps in your, you know, first week, it would be really easy to write code like this, but I'm really belaboring the point in these lectures to try to get you aware of what's going on under the hood. And the reason why is we're eventually going to do stuff next week and the week after where we we'll start connecting things in perhaps more surprising ways. And rather than just having straight line code, there'll be other control flow constructs that start changing what connects to what in kind of more interesting ways. But we'll make sure we understand at the beginning uh, how this all kind of fits together. Yes. Uh, I don't think that should cause a problem, right? So you think if I had like, you know, uh, you know, uh, my alt wire equals my wire, right? So that's obviously fine. But then if I actually was to, yeah. So part of why that works is remember, these are valves, right? And so what does my wire represent? My wire, you can think of it as a reference to that wire. If I say my alt wire, it's going to copy the value of my wire, right? So in other words, at, at, at the end of this line here, we're going to have my alt wire also pointing here. So it's not going to be pointing here. How would I point to my wire? Mm, I don't even know how to do that in kind of direction. Just call. Maybe it's possible. I don't know. But yeah, so basically, in other words, by assigning something else like this, you're going to, if, 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 if the thing you're talking about is a reference and you assign something else, it's going to copy that reference. Yes. Um, not really, right? Like so normally, when we say move semantics in C++, we're talking about the idea of okay, well, we're going to try to avoid a need for a copy, or we're going to have two versions of it, and like we're going to say one has data and the other one doesn't have data, and then we move it, and now one has data and the one's not the data, and it's swapped. Like I said, kind of in this you know garbage collected safe language mentality. Um, that doesn't really happen too much. But one nice thing is because it's a functional language. And things are typically immutable, and we're typically using valves. It actually avoids a lot of copies, right? Because it can it can just point to the same thing, right? There's no there's no danger in doing so. Um, and so that's one thing that's kind of an interesting trick is, like I said, um, you should use valves basically for near entirety of this course, and not exclusively. 
there will be times in this course, even though you have a vowel, which means that reference can't change what it points to, the thing you point to can be mutable, right? So even though you have an immutable reference, you always point to the same thing. So the immutability in your case is the, you, is the vowel. My wire is always going to point to this wire. That can't be changed because it's a vowel. However, the contents of this wire object can change. And actually, in this example, they do, right? At the point when we first write this line of code, this object's kind of floating in space, right? And then when we, um, when we all revert back to the simpler one, uh, then when we do this, right, uh, we are modifying this object to have as a, to record the fact this input came from this XOR gate. So this line of code has a mutable side effect, right? We're mutating the contents of my wire. And, and also the contents, uh, yeah, the contents of my wire, right? And then meanwhile, same with this line, right? This line, we are modifying the contents of io.c to know that its input is coming from alt wire. So it's good to keep talking these questions, right? So like I said, in this case, the val, the constantness, so to speak, refers to who you're pointing to. The thing you're pointing to itself could be mutable. And in this case, we actually are even changing it. Yes. Oh, I think you're saying um, a little bit of both. <laughs> so the reason why these statements don't work on their own is you need to be inside of one of these contexts from a module. So yes, you absolutely write by inferring that by being inside this module context, there's some sort of environmental hooks that behind the scenes are working by the library. Uh, but you know, there there is going to be um, a uh, modification now. In complete honesty, I'm thinking about my head right now, and the answer is I don't remember. It may be the case that it's like a case class, in which case it's going to like copy the case class to like get a different value to it. It's actually not mutating, it's making a new one and changing it, but like effectively it's mutating it. Um, yeah, good point. Okay, cool. Great questions. And like I said, I think much of the time, you know, you can kind of forget about all this kind of stuff and just focus on, oh yeah, I'm going to write hardware I need to write, you know, an XOR gate text some wires and you're, and you're rolling. But occasionally there'll be one where you're a little pause and you kind of think about it, sketch out a schematic, try to remember yourself what you're doing and remember which is which. Um, like I said, when students get confused, uh, you know, common things are things like, oh, well, I'm gonna change this thing. So I have to use a var because I wanna make sure I wanna change it. The answer is no, you're not gonna change it, right? You are mutating the wire, but the val is fine here. Or like, Oh, if I'm making the vowels, I mean the wire can't change the value in the hardware design? No, 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 no. Your hardware design, the values can definitely change on the wires. It's totally fine, right? And so these are the kind of things to keep track of when we're talking about this language. Okay. So, yeah, okay. Any more wire questions? When's another big leap? <laughs> okay, let's do one. So, this is an interesting construct in Chisel, and it's not quite the same as other hardware languages. So it's worth taking a second at it. So what the when condition is, is well, inside this block, you perform the operations, right? Um, and that's a little bit counterintuitive at first if you think about it, because normally hardware, the whole point is hardware is constant, right? Hardware exists, you build it, it doesn't change its structure, right? So what's going on? Uh, what's going on is basically, you're saying in a when block, whatever this condition is true, make the things in this block true, uh, so in this case, I have a kind of like a if else, I'm using implement a mux, right? So you can do it just like this. But basically the result is you're not required to have an otherwise. You can have a when by itself. But yes, whens under the hood get mapped to muxes. That's kind of the key thing. Um, so you can have a when, you can have an otherwise, basically like an else. You can have a else when, which um, is, you know, uh, like, like an if else, right? And so in this case, yeah, we're actually going to get a mux like before, and the tools are smart to recognize what's going on and actually use the exact same operators. So from this point of view, the Verilog is not even that changed, right? Or not even changed at all, technically. Um, but we'll see much more common cases of when. Uh, a lot of times when when is used, we don't even bother the otherwise. We just want a single case. Uh, but that's kind of the point. So when is, you know, so when this condition is true, that happens. So we can see, for example, when iota s is true, 
do this connection, right? So when I out of S is true, do that connection. Uh, when I out of out is false, uh, do this other connection, right? So in this case, for example, both of these clauses happen to touch the exact same output, so they're able to be combined into the same mux statement. That's an optimization by the tools internally recognize opportunity and combine the logic together. There's no requirement these touch the same signals, right? It's going to be like, you know, IO out two or something. Now, if I do that right now, it's going to break because IO out two is not declared, but, you know, you can imagine that's the case. I saw another question. Yeah, great question. Let's do that right now. So what happens if I do this, which if we look at it, right, uh, when IO.S is true, IO.out is connected to IO.in1. Okay, when IO.S is false, what do people think should happen? Okay, well, let's just experiment. All right. It's going to yell at this because guess what? Uh, you have a disconnected wire, right? Chisel's like, don't do that, right? <laughs> Once again, make things compile time errors. Uh, I owe that out is not connected, right? It's connected some of the time, not all the time. That would be weird. Now, Verilog, of course, would be like, oh, no problem. That's as high impedance right now. And like, yeah, we, we, <laughs> we, we've all had that bug and then had to trace it down, right? But no, Chisel's like, no, no, no. It's not fully specified. So you are required to have an assign a connection to everything that you're going to use. It, it just can do trace, tracing on the design graph, right? It says, hey, guess what? Like, out and out is going through a conditional block. So that means there could be conditions uh, for which it's not assigned. Now, let's be really clever. This is fun. Actually, I don't know if I can get this one right. We'll see. Um, suspense is killing me over here. Uh, yeah, see, it's not, it's not that smart. Because we, we know from looking at this that these... Two conditions cover all possibilities. The tool cannot quite figure that out. Um, well, no, it, it'll alert you if something has conditions under which it doesn't know what it should be. Now, whether that should be an else when and otherwise or something else, it's up to you. In the next slide, I'm going to show you how you can do connections like this. You can also have a connection up here. That's also fine. You have like a default value in a way. That's totally okay. Um, yeah, I was, I, was, I was hoping this one would get this tricky one, but I don't know if it's quite that clever. Uh, yeah, another thing to point out, there is a dot here on the otherwise. You have to, ha you have, to have that dot. Um, this is the one of these you know, small wrinkles from having a language embedded in another language. Um, in this particular case, that dot needs to be there, unfortunately. Okay, but we can go ahead and get working Verilog again. Advance. So as I was saying a second ago, with when statements, and more generally, Chisel has what is called last connect semantics. So in other words, if you connect to the same wire and realize you know ports are also wires or whatever, uh, multiple times, uh, whatever is the last connection operation in program order is the one that's going to be there, right? So you can think of it as like. I have a design that has certain connections in it. As the program is being evaluated, I'm adding things to the design, connecting things to it, right? So you can kind of imagine it's like graph being built in time, you know, and being connected, et cetera. And so, yeah, so if you connect, make one connection, and then a little bit later, you make a different connection to the same output or same input, the, the newer one wins, right? So let's look at this example, right? We have W. It's a wire. We connect it to one. Uh, and then, you know, I'll, I'll take the one out of the way at first. Let's just do that. So if we just look at this, yeah, guess what? This wire connected to one, connected to the output, boom, the output's just gonna be one, straightforward. Now with this one statement in there, what happens? Well, if out of x is true, w is seven. If out of x is false, this when statement you know, is, isn't active, it's not doing anything, so then the default you know, original value one that you holds true. So you can see now we get a mux out of this, right? So when's typically mapped to muxes, um, now what's interesting, for example, is what if I was to do this? Correct. Yeah. So one, one's now the last operation in that program order. So one's going to just, you know, in compiler terms, dominate, right? You know, that's what they call that. But, you know, under all execution paths, it's going to be the one that wins. 
this, this is a little bit this is a little bit interesting. Right? Normally, when you're doing hardware description languages, right? The order of statements doesn't matter too much because you're describing statements and connecting them together. That's true in Chisel too, right? You can change the order of a lot of statements and be just fine. Obviously, you need to declare things before you reference them. But as long as you obey that, you can definitely reorder a lot of stuff in your hardware design. That's perfectly fine. So you're just kind of describing components and connecting them together. This is that one case where order matters. And what's happening is we're making multiple connections to the same thing. But then whichever one's the last one in program order is the one to win. This is the last connect semantics, right? So like I said, in this case, uh, W is connected to in two locations, right? So how do we resolve that? Well, whichever one is the last in program order. So originally W is a hard coded to one. Here W is coded to a, a, a when. Now, like I said, the way the when works is it, um, when this is true, it intervenes. But if this is not true, the when does not intervene. So then it takes the prior value W, which happens to be the one. That's what's going on here. Yes. Oh, good question. So how is this compared to multi-driven nets? So multi-driven nets is something that happens where you have multiple drivers. Uh, and that's the problem because the hardware, how do you have multiple drivers? Chisel solution that is, this would be a multi-driven net, right? The solution in this case is no, no, no. Whichever one's the last one in program order is the one that wins. And uh, now that we've talked about it, hopefully this won't be surprising. Uh, it turns out this design choice actually is pretty good in my opinion, right? Number one, actually for language implementers, this is the easiest one to do. Because basically you can imagine they have code inside the chisel library, like, you know, you build up objects, it makes a connection. Oh, you make another connection? Make another connection, right? That couldn't be easier. So from their point of view, this looks easy. But I think from people rat reasoning about programs, it does make sense. Where you kind of imagine your typical situation, in the common case, you're not going to do multiple connections to the same wire too often, right? The times you are going to do that, you're going to do this. You're going to have perhaps a default value and then like optionally override it. It's kind of a very common structure. Uh, there are other cases where maybe, for example, you might inadvertently like a 400 line module, like assign the same wire twice. Yeah, that's, that could happen. Uh, and yeah, if the second one happens to be the correct behavior, and then you, let's say you delete that line and the first one comes active, that's the wrong behavior, have fun with that bug. But <laughs> uh, that's that. So coming back to these connection semantics, like I said, uh, this is actually one of the spots I've been researching the last few years. And so in this course, using the regular connection operator, which is this one, later on, I'm going to cover something called the bolt connection operator, which is a more sophisticated one that can do multiple things at the same time. There's four new connection operators in the newest version of Chisel. Um, so that there, there, there's, there's some, a lot of different cases of, and the nuance of why there's so many different flavors of connection operators is because how do you want things to handle the cases when, you know, the things aren't quite the same, the ports don't quite match up. If things are connected or connected, how important is important it is? These operators kind of capture all these cases, right? Um, but it's a bit complicated and, and for getting started, it's not necessary, right? Fear is pretty simple, right? Like I said, at the end of the day, think about your design is just, I'm going to pick out the hard components I want, you know, should be able to draw a schematic, okay. I'm going to essentially those components like Lego building blocks and then connect them together, right? And a lot of times the connections are very natural, right? Like I said, like going back to our, uh, you know, like XOR example, um, oops, I advanced rather than going backwards. Um, for example, yeah, I mean, here we didn't think about it, but we were connecting the inputs to it when we made the thing at the same time, right? Um, cool. Oops, went too far again. Cool. Okay, then let's go ahead and use this, right? So we earlier today's lecture, I showed you how to do absolute value with a mux. Here we're doing it using a when. It perhaps is more intuitive, right? We have a default value. So originally your output's going to be the input. And just if our input happens to be negative, then we invert it. And we get the same hardware we had earlier. It's a little bit more complicated because we're doing sign comparisons because it's, you know, a sign number. But, you know, fundamentally, it's the same thing. <laughs> um, in particular, in order to get the minus thing, for example, it's, you know, doing zero minus that. But, yeah, it's the same thing, effectively. So, so this is kind of more, I, I mean, to be honest, like I said, this is the same as us writing mux. But, like, perhaps I, arguably, I would argue this is more intuitive to me, right? Um, and so that's cool. You can write code this way. And it's one of these things where we're not paying any, you know, hardware costs for this, you know, clarity. Cool. Okay.
So uh, a few more things to cover. Okay, so um, in the earlier example, we showed you had parameterized widths. Uh, what's interesting is actually the widths, you're not required to specify them all the time. They can do bit width inference and determine what the width of things should be. Now, the, pe the question is, well, how is it determined the width? It depends on the operation you're performing. So based on the operation, some operations have different behaviors than others. And so as a result, maybe you forget those rules. Look at this cheat sheet. It'll tell you, okay, if I have n bits of this and y bits of this, and I do this operation on them, what's the result going to be? Um, a lot of things behave kind of like you expect. So for example, the plus sign truncates, right? So for example, here we have uh, you know, two numbers being added together that are w bits wide. The output, we didn't give it a width. It's going to infer it. So let's go ahead and see what it does. It infers it to be the same width. It infers it to be 8 bits. So this is referred to as truncating because guess what? If I add, you know, two numbers near the maximum value of 8 bits, the result's going to overflow. It's going to be bigger than 8 bits, right? So technically to heap that result, you need 9 bits, right? And so guess what? For truncating addition, um, we are going to lose that. Now, what's interesting is they actually have other op versions of the operators to have different behaviors for the bit width inference. So for example, let's say you want to truncate. Yes. So the original plus is the same as the truncating plus. Cool. But let's say you want to grow to make sure you don't lose it. That's fine too. Um, and so, yeah, uh, it will typically kind of do gymnastics to match it. So a lot of times you design, you can spend time not in describing widths. And it's kind of very convenient to kind of just let the bit widths propagate and, you know, be inferred through your design. But sometimes you really care about widths, right? Sometimes like in the processor, you know, you want to have a 32 or 64 bit, you know, value because, you know, an important part of your processor. Or maybe you're doing a more numerical approach for your code and you actually care about getting the exact right number and you do care about not losing bits on the overflow, for example. So that's why it's kind of good to be kind of aware of this stuff. Now what's interesting is, let's say, for example, we start specifying this width, right? So, okay, that's all consistent. But now if we do this one, it's actually going to truncate it. Right, so here, like I said, this is the non-truncating addition. So this is gonna produce a nine bit result, but we connected it to an eight bit output. And so this is the very log to do the right thing, right? It does the nine bit addition, has a nine bit result. So you, at this point you've lost no precision, but because you connected it to an eight bit thing, it, you know, it trusts you designer to know what you're doing and it truncated it. Um, so yeah, so maybe in this case, it almost is better to leave it, you know, unspecified. I don't know. Because in this case, yeah, if you really want to grow, and you don't want to lose any precision, then yeah, you need to have it grow by one. Now, additionally, like I said, if you had two n-bit numbers, you know, the result is going to be conveyable in n plus one bits. But if you like multiply two n-bit numbers, of course, not lose anything, you need to have two n-bits, right? So you can see, depending on the operation you're doing, uh, you need to grow or shrink may be different. If you forget how these things happen, you can look at the cheat sheet. Um, but this is a general design practice, right? I would set the widths you know for sure need to be certain widths and let the ones you don't know for sure, perhaps leave them unspecified, but occasionally pick your barrel to make sure they're doing what you expect. That would be my advice. Um, cool. Questions? Okay. Then let's put this to work, right? So following to Clay's question from earlier on about two's complement, let's, um, make a hardware module that changes the encodings of negative numbers, right? So remember from maybe way back in undergrad, you had multiple ways of doing negative numbers. You could do two's comment, which hopefully is the one you remember the best. That's the one we actually use most often. But it's actually not the simplest, right? That one's sometimes a little complicated. Remember, go, okay, I can negate all the bits, add one. Another alternative is something called sign and magnitude, which is simply just, you have the magnitude, which is a number, and another bit, which is a sign bit. You know, is it one of its negative, zero of its positive, something like that, right? Okay, so let's convert sign and magnitude as input. So we have a single bit for the sign, uh, some number of w bits for the magnitude, and we're going to turn down a two's complement, right? So in other words, um, if it's positive, meaning the sign bit is zero. So here we're using when an io dot sign. So when it's false, that puts in the otherwise, the else case. Yeah, the output's just the input, right? Now, what about the case when um, it's negative. Well, for two's comment, remember, we need to negate the bits and then add one. Uh, and so there we go. 
we defined it and we can go ahead and even print it out. And we see kind of all come together, right? So we see the way this kind of code broke down. Uh, yeah, we have um, the negation. We add one to it. And then the, you know, one statement has this mux, we're kind of choosing between the two alternatives, right? Um, and you can see that, for example, when it's positive, that upper bit is set to zero with a concatenation right there. Um, and so when you look at the bear log from the chisel tool flow, to be really safe, they kind of tend to do one operation per line. Even though your original chisel code might do multiple operations per line, but sometimes you get these parameters in your bear log that you know have uh, a name you didn't write. Like I didn't declare t underscore one. Uh, a, good, a, a big giveaway is something that it inferred is it uses an underscore to start off to kind of tell you something that you didn't name, but it created. So the reason why it does is a fewfold, right? Number one, that despite Verilog being specified by a spec, there's plenty of ways Verilog is not specified, even though the spec is over a thousand pages. Additionally, across a wide range of CAD tools, and chisels chisel will run a lot of wide range of CAD tools, they behave a little differently. And we're to behave most differently start combining multiple operations in the same line. Like they have multiple different bit widths in the same operation, the tools get weird. And so to be extra defensive, um, they you know, basically do one operation per line, set the widths intentionally every time they do things. It's kind of very safe code. So as humans read this code, we're like, oh, this isn't quite the way I'd write it. Um, but it's actually very like, you know, safe code. And so some people kind of want to see like chisel design is like linted, you know, like cleaned up very long because yeah, you've taken care of these issues. Um, interestingly, the newest version of chisel has, you know, new internal and new backend. They worked really, really hard to make the Verilog more human friendly, more human readable. And they succeeded at that. Uh, but then they've now also re exposed these challenges with different ASIC CAD tools, uh, having different behaviors under certain conditions. And so as a result, uh, there's plenty of command line flags to choose whether you want the very safe one operation per line kind of mode, or do you want to have the really compact, more human friendly, human readable version? Cool. But Let's go back to the point of the lecture slide, which is showing off, hey, we've talked about whens. Here we are applying it, right? You can do kind of a little conversion example. We're also showing the arithmetic here. We're doing, you know, in this case, we want to get an extra bit. Because in tooth comment, we need an extra bit to kind of incorporate that. And so we use the non-truncating addition. Um, cool. So then when we have our bits, uh, we can, you know, do things like uh, manipulate them, right? So for example, let's say I want to grab I have a U and some number of bits, and I want to grab a, a subset of those bits. Yeah, you can give a high and low, just in parentheses, you know, four to two or something. Um, and, you know, you can get a single bit at a time, just a single parenthesis. Uh, now, one thing that's a little bit surprising is that when you have this syntax, it might be very natural to try to sign a single bit by putting this on the left side of a connect operator. That was just allowed for the longest time in the language. Recently, it's now allowed in a few cases, but <laughs> uh, the slide is not fully updated, but um, you'll be surprised how it seems like a really important thing, but actually you don't need as often as you might think you do. Um, in terms of other operations you can do on bits, you can concatenate bits, you know, combine them together. There's a cat operation. You can also do things like a fill. And so to kind of show these things working together, let's say you're trying to build a sign extending block, right? So we're in sign extension, you have some number of input bits, you can extend it to some number of output bits, and the rule for sign extension is for all those new additional bits, you are going to make them copies of the highest bit, the sign bit in the original number, right? So we're some number of input bits, some number of output bits. So, okay, so the input bit is, you know, W in wide and the output's W out wide. Okay, here are some assertions. Like I said, we we're talking about this earlier about making sure we don't have totally bonkers things. In this case, we're making sure that there's at least something here. Uh, this will not work with zero bits because we need at least one bit to have a sign bit. Um, additionally, we need the output to be bigger, so it's actually extending it. Um, so what happens? Well, we you know take the sign bit, which is the most significant bit of this input. So this is w in minus bits, right? So it's from w in minus one to zero. So w in minus one is the uh, most significant. We're going to go ahead and fill out the remainder bits we need with the you know number of bits we need to fill in with that most significant sign bit, and then kind of two of them together, right? The original input. And this, so we kind of go ahead and put this all out. So it comes together, right? We grab the sign bit, um, and then we create the extension where you can see actually the way it chose to do this was, well, whatever bit this is, either just replicate it that many times, either all ones or all zeros, and then it can kind of come together. But even though whatever happens under the hood by the chisel or fertile compilers, right? 
this is how we express it over here. Um, this is a nice parameterized code, right? So I can, you know, change this. It does the right things. It makes the extension portion smaller. I'm actually curious why I have this constraint. So let's see what happens if I remove that and make this four. Something's going to break. Let's find out what breaks. It hangs. Okay, why is this hang? Um, I think maybe Phil is not like working on zero bits, probably. Phil probably wants that at least one bit as input. Um, cool. Other questions? Yes. Correct. Yeah, so normally that's not allowed. I believe this version allows you to do that. So let's, let's go ahead and see what happens, right? If I was to, I don't know, say iota out zero colon equals, uh, let's just say uh, one, right? Yeah, it's going to hang. So sometimes it hangs in the Jupyter environments because it's a warning that's not being copied all the Jupyter kernel extensions. Um, like I said, so normally the extraction is like extraction, and so you can't assign it. Um, so it can be frustrating. There's times in languages, like Verilog makes it very easy to do that stuff. We want to assess, assign a subset of things. And so as a result, yeah, you kind of have to often, uh, on your code, let's say you do want to conditionally override something, you end up taking the portion you want to override, and it can concatenate out the original things. It's a little bit more verbose, right? So let's say, for example, I wanted to set the lowest bit to one or something. Uh, I could do that. And I could do that by basically saying, you know, io.out. Um, oops. Let's just say typing. OK. Uh, is going to be cat. Uh, and we're going to say of the original io.out. Um, I guess this is like a head operation, right? I won't use head because we haven't covered that yet. Let's just say io out um, w in plus w out minus one to one. Oops, that's in the wrong spot. And then, yeah, and then, like I said, we enforce the last bit to be one. Oops, I didn't capitalize that. I didn't do the math right. Oops, it's not, yeah. Combinational loop, okay. Yeah, I want the old value, okay, yeah. Um, we can save this with a val. Good eyes, people. Yes. Beautiful, right? <laughs> Not really, but uh, you get the idea, right? Um, so yeah, like I said, the fact you don't have this ability to like assign individual bits or bit ranges is a little annoying. You sometimes to do things like cats like this. I believe some version, future version of Chisel, maybe Chisel 5, which I don't have right now, can do this. But um, this is a common complaint from even Chisel 1 days. <laughs> uh, but in the practice, the reason why it's gone this long this way is because it comes up actually more rarely than you expect. But that's still a concern. You're absolutely right. Cool. So that's all I have for today. As you saw, I posted the lab one, and it's due Tuesday. So in other words, you're not going to see me in lecture before it's due. So please <laughs> go ahead and get lab one done, turn it in, uh, blow up the Slack if you have any questions. Uh, I'll be posting homework one hopefully later tonight, if not tomorrow. It'll be due next Friday. Uh, it should not be super long, but it'll still be good to get started early, get it done with. Don't risk losing some days on your first homework. Cool. Have a weekend, folks.